42-year-old woman with a fairly ordinary life. And I want to make it clear, I don't mean ordinary in a bad way. I always had planned my life to be average, if you will. I'm just not the kind of person that had super extravagant dreams that I wanted to accomplish. I've always been the kind of person who was completely okay with having an office job and working an 8-5 to workday. I sometimes wondered why I never had the ambition to be great like most people did growing up, but I figured it must have been because my parents also just live ordinary lives. This specific situation happened when I was 40 and working in an accounting office as a secretary slash receptionist. It was boring work, but I honestly didn't really mind. It was only 9 hours out of my day and the pay was decent. There was, however, one con to the job, and that con was a man named Gary. Gary joined the company a few years back. I had been working there about five years by that time, and I'd seen many people come and go. I never really expected someone to stay for very long, given the fact that our building wasn't very nice, and I knew for a fact that the assistant position he filled for one of the accountants did not pay well at all. I kind of felt bad for him at first, to be honest. He was optimistic about the job and super excited, but by the time a year came around, he was obviously sad and bored. I guess feeling bad for him is what made me try to befriend him in the first place, and that's something I'll regret forever. Gary was a nice, seemingly regular guy. We went out for lunch a couple of times a week as friends and sometimes went for a drink after work. Now let me tell you, Gary was boring, possibly the most dry, unfunny person I'd ever met and all he had to talk about was himself and his cats. There's only so many times you can hear a person talk about their cat's favorite toys and treats before you want to bury your head in the sand. It was painful, but I continued my friendship with him because I knew I was the only friend he had and I would have hated to hurt his feelings at the time. After around six months of us being friends and spending short periods of time together outside of work, I noticed Gary becoming very clingy. He would text me during my days off to ask me where I was and if I'd meet him for lunch or drinks and when I politely said no, he would get angry and tell me it was our tradition and I couldn't mess up our tradition, stuff like that. The other thing he hated was when I mentioned my husband. He really hated that. If we were having a conversation, I brought it up. Gary would scoff and ask to change the subject. Or if he'd asked me to get lunch and I told him I had plans with my husband, he'd actually tell me to cancel with him so he and I could go instead. That's something I found very strange. Eventually, he became this person who tried his best to control me. But Gary was just a guy that I worked with. He couldn't tell me what to do, so I always ignored him. One day, however, he overheard me talking to another one of my coworkers about a barbecue I was having at my house that coming weekend that my husband and I were hosting. I had actually asked my other coworker not to mention it to me at work because I didn't want Gary to know about it, but of course he did. She basically yelled across the whole office how excited she was for the BBQ and that she was so happy to be invited. As I expected, Gary came rushing up to my desk with an angry look on his face as he began littering me with questions on why he wasn't invited and if I hated him now. He was talking so fast I wouldn't have been able to get a word in if I wanted to. Finally, I ended up just raising my voice and telling him to shut up. He didn't like that, but I followed the shut up with an invite to the barbecue. I kind of had to invite him at that point. I made up some dumb excuse as to why I hadn't invited him yet and went with something like, Oh, I wanted to invite you in person. He bought it which was all that mattered, and in my head, the barbecue was already ruined just by the fact that I knew he'd be there. The weekend rolled around, and my husband and I were setting up for the barbecue. It was pretty hot outside, but we had a swimming pool we were set to utilize that day. People started to arrive, and we began cooking hamburgers and hot dogs. After an hour, Gary still hadn't showed up, and I was really hoping that would have meant that he wasn't going to. But there he was stepping into our backyard from the side gate wearing a Hawaiian shirt, and to everyone's shock and horror, a Speedo. I was visibly confused and upset and felt like walking over to him and telling him to leave, but my husband convinced me causing a scene would have been the bigger issue and I should just let it go. After a while, our daughter came home and joined the party. She was 16 at the time and most of her time during the barbecue was spent sunbathing by the pool. I began to notice Gary staring at her, which I found very creepy. 
I walked up to him and asked him how he was enjoying the barbecue, but instead of answering, he just pointed to my daughter, and the words that came out of his mouth disgusted me and changed the way I looked at him from that second on. Who is she? Oh my god, the things I'd do to that girl. The anger I felt in that moment was so intense, I could barely even find the words to tell him to get out of my house. Instead, I went up to my husband and told him what Gary had said. I watched my husband storm over to Gary, but I didn't hear what was said. Instead, I just saw Gary storm out of our backyard and yell some expletives before closing the gate. I asked my husband what happened, but his only response was that he handled it. For the next few weeks, work was normal, besides the occasional glares I received from Gary. I didn't care, though. I was just glad to have him out of my life. After work, he would watch me walk to my car, which I found a little creepy, but I tried not to think much about it. Gary had become known for being a little creepy around the office, so this was normal in everyone's minds. He tried texting me multiple times to apologize, but I ignored him. I was done with our friendship, if you could even call it that, and just wanted him to leave me alone. About a month after the BBQ, my daughter started complaining to me that whenever she was in her room, she felt like someone was watching her. Every time I went in there, she had her curtains fully closed because she said it was the only way she felt safe. I felt bad for her, but we never caught anyone looking into her window, so there wasn't much we could do to make her feel more comfortable other than tell her that we'd keep her safe always. One day though, everything changed. My husband always picked our daughter up from school after soccer practice, but this day he was running a little late. When he pulled up, he noticed a car pulled up beside her and she had opened the door and was just about to get in. My husband yelled out of the window and asked her what she thought she was doing. Almost immediately the car sped away with our daughter standing on the curb of her school, confused and visibly shaken. What she told my husband shook me to my core. She said that after she'd gotten done with soccer practice, she went to the front of campus where she usually met my husband and had started to wait for him to get there. My husband didn't think to text her at the time that he was running late, but she waited nonetheless. She knew he'd be there. Instead, she said a man pulled up in front of her and told her he was her mom's work friend, Gary, and that I told him to go pick her up. Of course, this wasn't true, but she'd seen him at the barbecue and assumed that he was telling the truth. That's when she opened the door and was about to get in until my husband showed up. After she told my husband what happened, he called the police who managed to actually track down Gary. He was charged with attempted kidnapping, and when they searched his car, they found duct tape, rope, and zip ties, along with over a hundred pictures of her in her bedroom and at her school. The police said that he'd been stalking her for the past month and that this must have been planned. He was sentenced to two years in prison, as well as receiving a no-contact order. His two-year sentence went by fast, and he is out now. We changed houses and had her switch schools just in case, and so far we haven't seen him around town. We don't know what he had planned with her that day, but we are beyond glad. We never had to find out. This story took place maybe 10 years back, so if things sound a little off at times, it's because my memory of the incident had gotten fuzzy over the years, but I'll try my best to give as much detail as possible. At the time, I was 22 and had just started working reception at a marketing office. I was trying to pay my way through college, and this seemed like as good a job as any. I remember my first day very well because everyone was so inviting and sweet. Almost everyone came up to my desk to say hi and introduce themselves. It was great. I thought I was going to fit in there perfectly since everyone else seemed so normal and nice. As the months went on, I made a few friends. They were all older than me, but it didn't seem to matter in an office setting. Although it was a little hard to relate sometimes when the older women would talk about their kids and grandkids when I was only still in college. Even though I had only a few close friends at the office, I was at least acquaintances with almost everyone else. Almost. There was a man who worked with us named Enzo, and he was interesting to say the least. 
Everything with him was routine-based. He walked into work every morning at 8.10 on the dot. He walked the same path to his desk and organized his pens the same way every single day. When he picked up the phone, he always tapped it five times. Now let me make it clear, these are just examples as I don't remember the exact number he did things in, but it was stuff like this. Then there was a bunch of little things too. What I do remember noticing is that there were only a few people in the office he would talk to. I ended up asking my friend Alex about it and I can't say I was surprised when he told me Enzo had a severe form of OCD. He told our boss about it when he'd started working and our boss told the other employees at the time just to be sure that they would be patient with Enzo instead of getting upset at his quirks. Over the years since Enzo had started working there, many of the company's original employees quit, retired, or were promoted to another position outside of our building. So the only people Enzo talked to were the three people who he had originally began working with since his first day. And since he had a strict routine, it didn't involve him introducing himself to every new employee that walked in. I guess Enzo had told our boss about this who understood and said as long as he did his job, he wouldn't have to go out of his way to introduce himself to new people. I tried to introduce myself to him a few times before learning about him and I just figured that he was rude and ignoring me. And this made me rethink everything and I felt bad for judging him right off the bat like that. Everyone knew about Enzo and what he was dealing with mentally and we all worked hard to make work a safe environment for him. We didn't get in the way of his routine and whenever any of us needed something from him, we made sure to ask one of the people he talked to to relay the information to him. It always worked out and it was pretty smooth for a while. Except one day when our boss had a client come into the office and instead of meeting him for lunch like he usually did, this specific client was a bit of a hassle. I would met him once before and he was honestly just super annoying and very loud and intrusive. He also didn't respect personal space at all, which frustrated me more than anything. We'll call him Mark. Well, Mark came in one day and it was hard not to notice him. He flung open the doors and started yelling across the room for our boss to come out and greet him. I politely tried asking him to sign into the office, but he just laughed at me and continued his rampage throughout the office. He went over to almost everyone asking if they were going to take good care of him and I could tell that he was making everyone else just as uncomfortable as he was making me. It was only when we all saw him making his way over to Enzo when I started to worry. I watched as Mark sat on the edge of his desk and started patting Enzo's head asking him if he was having a good day buddy. He was messing his hair up in the process and I could see Enzo's face turning red as he did this. Then Mark started going through the papers on Enzo's desk. This is when multiple of my coworkers got up and asked Mark to stop messing with Enzo, to which he replied, If he had a problem, he could tell me himself. At that point, he'd begun playing with Enzo's pens and basically laughing in his face. I guess Enzo had enough because he stood up and screamed in Mark's face while pushing him off his desk. And that's when things got a little violent. Mark was on the ground and we all watched in horror as Enzo began kicking him as hard as he could, just brutally landing blows on Mark's side and head. He got maybe about ten good hard kicks in before someone ended up pulling him away. He didn't like that either since he hated being touched, which led to him beginning to punch the guy holding him. No one could get him to calm down, and I guess at some point during the scuffle, someone had called the police. They ended up coming through the doors, and all I could do was point towards Enzo and Mark's defeated body laying on the ground as he took short breaths. They arrested him for assault, and paramedics came and sorted out Mark. He went to the hospital, and we were informed that he had a severe concussion and a couple of his ribs actually had broken, and even punctured his lung. He ended up suing Enzo, but the trial never really went anywhere once footage of the incident and context of Enzo's mental illness was brought to light. Unfortunately, Enzo was fired, and although I have this feeling that he would have quit anyways, we all felt really bad for him, considering if Mark had just left him alone, he could have kept the job that he had gotten used to for so many years. The three employees he talked to did end up keeping in touch with him, and I was happy to hear that he had gotten another job that didn't mind his routine-based lifestyle. I quit that job about four years back, but to this day, I still think about Enzo and wonder what he's up to. I just hope Mark learned his lesson and that everyone reading this can take away the fact that you really shouldn't intentionally mess with anyone. 
You never know what they're going through, and if what you're doing could have a bigger impact than you think. I'm 32, and at the time of the story, I worked in a fairly busy office setting. I won't bore you with my job, but I can tell you it's incredibly average and not at all what I envisioned for myself when I used to think about what I'd be doing in my adult life. Everyone always told me college was the answer to getting a good paying job doing something I loved. But after I graduated, I was $100,000 in debt and couldn't find a job in the field I'd gone to school for. So I guess I just had to settle. And let me tell you, I was not happy about it. I felt lied to. Like everyone who told me college would lead to this amazing life, had just played this huge prank on me that cost me years of my life and thousands of dollars. I was angry. My work consists of a lot of paperwork and phone calls and it makes my life super boring. And not just boring, but also sad. I'm sad at how my life has led me here. I get some people who strive for these kinds of jobs and are happy in them, but I'm just not. And I'm sure that comes across in my attitude throughout the day. I actually know it comes out in my attitude. Most of my coworkers don't like me. My boss actually told me that he would have fired me just because of my attitude and what he called a lack of consideration from my colleagues if I wasn't so good at my job. But I hated my job so much that if he did fire me, I really wouldn't care. I'd just find another job somewhere else, probably still doing something I hated. I will say I do realize now that it wasn't right for me to take out my own internal anger on my coworkers. I should have realized that at the time, but I kind of like that they all avoided me. I was a total introvert and socializing isn't my strong suit anyways, so if my attitude kept them away, then okay. My only issue was I wasn't just inconsiderate, but it was also just plain rude. And at the time I knew everyone called me the office bully, but a part of me found it amusing. I just thought that it meant everyone hated me. Thinking back on it now, it was just because I was legitimately mean. I had issues building up inside of me and I guess subconsciously I wanted to bring everyone else down with me, as a bully does. I hate even admitting this right now, but I have to be real and I'm sure what I say next is the reason for what happened to me. I made fun of people at work, not just under my breath or behind their backs, but to their faces. I laughed and joked about how people looked and what they ate or the clothes they wore. If someone was having a hard time at work, I thought it was funny to call them stupid, stuff like that. I know it was wrong, but at the time I think I just wanted people to feel the torment I felt in my own mind and body. People used to tell me I was hurting their feelings and I should realize the consequences of my actions, but I usually just laughed off their concerns. I spent a lot of time in HR, but I guess I must have been an asset to the company because I was always just warned but never actually laid off. This specific day I was in the break room eating lunch when one of my coworkers walked in. The second she saw me she rolled her eyes and went to the fridge. I'm changing her name for the sake of the story so we'll call her Angela. Angela was a heavy set woman and I guess that day that's what I decided to make fun of. She had brought leftover pizza for lunch and was heating it up when I made an awful comment that was something like, do you really need to be eating that? I laughed about it at the moment but now I just cringe and feel disgusted thinking about it. The look on her face is something I'll always remember. Everyone in the room went silent and what I will never forget is the tears beginning to stream down her face as she ran out of the room. Everyone else in the room looked at me with such anger and disappointment that I didn't know what to do other than get up and walk out and back to my desk. That moment was almost like an epiphany to me. I actually started to see the way I was treating people as wrong and man I felt terrible. I wanted to go over to Angela and apologize but I knew then wasn't the right time. She was surrounded by a group of women trying to console her and all I wanted was to shrivel up into nothingness for what I had done to a woman who had never been rude to me or anyone in this office a day in her life. The next day I came into the office and put my lunch in the fridge like I usually do. As the morning went on, no one would talk to me, or even look at me for that matter. It was like I was being shunned, but I knew I deserved it. The guilt I felt was intense, and I wanted nothing more than to take back all the awful things I'd said the years before to pretty much everyone I worked with. 
but there was no fixing these relationships. These people knew me as the office bully, and I didn't blame them. That's exactly what I was. Around 11 a.m. that morning, I decided I need to apologize to Angela. I slowly made my way over to her desk and began to apologize, but she wouldn't even look at me or even acknowledge my presence, which only made me feel even worse. I sulked all the way over to the break room and retrieved my lunch. I decided to just eat at my desk to avoid everyone else who didn't even bother to hide their mean stares. I opened my Tupperware and began eating my pasta, but something seemed off. It was a little crunchy and I knew I hadn't put anything crunchy in my pasta. And that's when I looked down, horrified at what was in my container and what I'd just eaten. Peanuts. Now this might not scare everyone, but there's a reason it scared me. Terrified me, really. I am deathly allergic to peanuts. If I don't use my EpiPen, within minutes my airway can close and I can die. It is literally life or death. I immediately felt my tongue beginning to tingle and my heart began to race. I rushed to reach into my desk drawer, but my EpiPen wasn't there. And this is when I went into full panic mode. I only had a couple of minutes before I would no longer be able to breathe. I knew the office kept an emergency first aid kit on hand and the office was required to keep an epi on hand at all times. I ran into my boss's office and in the most hoarse voice imaginable I told him what was happening. Everything seemed to be moving in slow motion. At this point my tongue had begun to swell and breathing began to be a struggle. Everyone in the office was staring in horror. Everyone but Angela. Even in that moment where I was fearing for my life, I noticed that she was the only person still tending to her work. My boss found the EpiPen shortly after I burst into his office and I administered to myself, straight into my thigh. An ambulance was called and I was taken to the hospital for further evaluation. I was released the same night after receiving IV fluids and being monitored for a few hours. After telling my boss what happened, we both suspected someone had intentionally put peanuts in my lunch in order for me to have an allergic reaction. Only we couldn't exactly pinpoint who since everyone at the office hated me so much and no one did fess up to the police. Eventually, because there was no progress, the case was closed. No one ever admitted to it, but I gotta say my gut tells me to this day it was Angela. She never cared about what happened to me and was my only co-worker who never bothered to ask me what happened. I did get laid off a couple of weeks after that incident with them using multiple examples of my poor behavior in the past as the reason. I ended up getting another desk job doing the same kind of work, but now I try my absolute best to treat people with kindness and sincerity. Not because of what happened to me, but because I realized it took me way too long to understand that everyone deserves kindness and positivity in their life. There is enough negativity in the world and I refuse to add to it. But if any of you are out there, be careful who you treat poorly, especially if they have access to what goes into your body. You never know what they would or could do to harm you. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. Okay. I guess I'll just try to get straight to the point when telling you about the most terrifying day of my life. I work in a bookstore. Not a cozy, cutesy, small town vibes bookstore though. God, I wish, but no. I work in one of those obnoxiously huge, forces small bookstores to close bookstores. Knowing small businesses in the town I grew up in are forced to close their doors for good because the company I work for setting up shop in town isn't the best feeling in the world. Not even close. It does make me sad at times, especially when my mom comes complaining to me that all her friends complain to her about what I'm doing to the community. She's always asking me to quit or, at the very least, give back to the community that she says I'm stealing from. The funny thing is, I don't even run the store. I don't run the company. I just work in the offices connected to the bookstore and manage mid-level marketing for the company locally and in the surrounding areas. I also should say that I still work for this company, even after what happened. It really wasn't their fault, after all. Alright, so it was a random Thursday afternoon in October. My favorite month to work, by the way. There was an incredible view of Main Street from my desk on the third floor. 
the city went all out with decorations for Halloween. On every street sign and lamppost, there were fake spider webs and fall colored leaves clinging on and swinging in the wind. The trees were all changing color, and I couldn't help but stare at the world outside my office. The world I wish I spent more time in instead of at the stupid desk. This day, however, when I found myself looking out that window, I saw something that I, I wish I hadn't. The bank across the street was just a local one. Not one of those big branch banks scattered around every city in the country. It was always very quiet, and my mom actually worked there. She liked to wave at me through the front window every day at noon exactly when she was having her lunch. I always found it very sweet. Only this day, at noon, when I'd gone to the window to give mom a little wave and a smile, she wasn't there. Actually, no one was. Usually there'd be people walking in and out of the bank at this time of day, but there was no one there. And that's when I saw him. A man in a mask holding a gun at his side, peering out the window as if though he was looking for someone. And that's when panic mode set in. I rushed to the phone on my desk and dialed 911 while trying to keep my eyes on the man inside that building with my mom and who knows how many other people. My heart was racing so fast that I felt I could barely speak. When the dispatcher answered, it felt like it took everything in me to force out the words to describe what was happening right in front of me. She asked me a bunch of questions that I didn't really have the answer to considering the only thing I could see was just barely inside the front doors but I made sure to inform them the man inside was armed and that I had no idea if he had any partners. I guess that's all they needed from me since they insisted I didn't need to stay on the phone with them. In my haste to explain the situation, I didn't realize the masked man wasn't looking out the window down the street anymore. He was staring directly at me. I slammed the phone onto the receiver and closed the blinds as fast as I could. I couldn't help myself though. I had to take a peek and see if he was still looking toward my window. I slid my fingers through the cracks in the blinds and bent them slightly, creating just a small enough gap to peer through. And to my relief and somewhat surprise, he wasn't looking toward me anymore. Actually, I couldn't see him at all. He wasn't standing at the front of the bank anymore. And I felt this sense of relief fill me just for a second, and then fear came creeping in again when I realized not being able to see him meant that I didn't know what he was doing in there, and not knowing was the worst. He could be in there hurting someone and there would be nothing that I could do. In that moment of panic, not knowing if my mother was okay, my phone started ringing, and it was her. I picked up the phone and answered, immediately asking if she was okay. She was crying and scared, but she said that she was okay and so was everyone else, and that's when she told me something that gave me chills. She said something had spooked him and he'd walked right out the doors, across the street and into my building. She told me that I needed to get out of there as fast as possible. Without even thinking, I walked calmly toward my office door and down the row of desks. I whispered to everyone along the way that they needed to exit the building. Just as I reached the stairwell, I heard gunshots behind me. About eye level on the wall next to the door was the fire alarm button. I slammed my hand into it and couldn't help but cringe when the loud alarm began to blare overhead. That's when I felt a hand grasp harshly onto my forearm and pull me back. Well, you shouldn't have done that. His voice sounded raspy. I turned quickly to face him, knowing I had a better chance at fighting him off if we were face to face, and I could somehow predict what he was actually going to do next. Everyone down in the ground, now! I don't want to hurt anyone but I will if I have to. Got it? He looked around after he said that, like someone would actually have the guts to answer the madman with a gun. He was still holding on to me at that point, and it was starting to hurt. I just stared at the guy. I had no idea what he had planned or why he'd even come in here in the first place. But I, nor anyone in the building, had an interest in questioning him. He was scary and armed. No thanks. All right, since you're the one who set up the fire alarm, you're going to be the one to turn it off. He looked more annoyed than anything when he said that. My voice was shaky when I finally worked up the courage to answer him. I, I don't know how to turn it off. I, I think that's something the fire department does. 
He just rolled his eyes and shoved me into a chair at one of my coworkers' desks. Then you're going to call the fire department and tell them everything is alright here and it was just a stupid misunderstanding. And you're going to do it without complaining, otherwise I'm going to shoot one of these very nice people here. Okay? Okay? He sat down next to me and reluctantly let me use the computer to look up the phone number to the local fire department. When I finally reached them on the phone and repeated what the guy wanted me to say, they told me that they were aware of the situation and that help was on the way. Thankfully, it wasn't on speakers, so when he asked me what they said, I was able to lie and tell them they said they weren't coming and that they'd turn off the alarm. A few minutes later, the alarm turned off and the masked man continued his tirade, explaining how life wasn't fair and that God hated him. How his dad left when he was a kid and that to him, making bad decisions while he was growing up was just what led him here. This man was telling us his whole very dark, sad life story almost like he was trying to justify what he was doing. I was towards the back of the office so I couldn't tell when the police had gotten there. I just knew that they were there from the look on his face and the sweat pulling in his shirt. And that's when the phone calls started coming in. Hostage negotiator, I'm assuming. Every time they'd call, the guy would just get angrier and angrier and demand more outrageous things than the previous time they talked on the phone. At first, he wanted a car to drive away in and for no one to follow. Classic. This escalated to him practically begging whoever this person was on the other end of the phone for a helicopter to land on the roof of the building for him to fly away in, a fake passport, and ten million in cash. I was scared, but something was also telling me that he wasn't going to hurt anyone. If he was, he probably would have already done it. Eventually, he started letting a few of us go at a time. I was among the last three still trapped inside with him. It had been hours and I was exhausted, mentally and physically just done. The phone calls became less frequent for some reason, he even became more antsy. Just so genuinely desperate for a way to get out of there that didn't include jail time. And to be totally honest, some weird part of me started to feel bad for the guy. He's had this really rough, unfortunate life and I couldn't help but wonder how he would have ended up if he'd experienced a better upbringing than the one he was given. After some time, he finally let me and the two other hostages out of the building. My mother was standing there waiting for me and I ran into her arms so fast. Only minutes after exiting the front doors, a loud gunshot was heard coming from the building. The police started yelling, shots fired, shots fired, move in, while all rushing into the building. Turns out, he decided ending his life was a better option than going to prison for his crimes. He chose my office to do it, which only made me feel worse. I watched as they brought him out in a body bag and loaded him into the city coroner's van. I found myself standing there, watching as the van drove away and the police cleared the scene. He had no funeral, and essentially no one cared about his passing considering that there was no obituary written for him. Just... His death was announced in the local paper tied into the article about what happened that day. And I requested to switch offices, of course, and to this day, the view outside the window just doesn't look the same. Some part of the view now felt tainted, like the happiness I once saw in the world was clouded by the harsh reality that I hadn't realized before. That one person isn't always only to blame for the sad or dark outcome of their life. What I can say is, I hope, in death, he finally found the peace he was so desperately searching for in life. I live in a big city. It's not where I pictured living, but finding a job in a small town like the one I grew up in just wasn't working out. I'd gone to community college a few towns over since it was the only higher education school within a 50 miles radius, so there were not many options. No options, actually. I didn't consider moving for school since I had no money and my parents only offered to pay for my schooling if I stayed at home while I was attending. They were the controlling type. They even still tried to give me a curfew when I was like 20 years old. And I put a stop to that mentality pretty quick. Maybe it was the fact that I'm their only child, but I had to let them know that as an adult, they couldn't tell me what to do anymore. 
It was hard for them to accept at first, but they learned to respect my boundaries and I learned that compromise in a situation was better sometimes than arguing. I graduated with an associate degree in journalism and I was so excited. I knew I didn't want to do anything in the political field. Those journalists are hated so much and I wanted to write about something a little more lighthearted and fun. I wanted to work for a magazine. Maybe fashion or something like home decor. And it seemed more fun than business or finance or politics where everything is so serious all the time. The only problem was there were no writing jobs in my area. My only options job-wise were the local grocery store that people started working at when they were teenagers and never left or the gas station where all the junkies hang out. Neither of those sounded good to me, and I didn't want to be one of those people that commute three hours to work a day since the city was the only place that could find work. So, I decided I'd move. At first I didn't know where. I considered Los Angeles, but all writing jobs down there were all about celebrities. You know, OMG, he went where with her? It's such meaningless BS in my opinion. Then I thought about Seattle, but then I remembered the awful weather they have up there. It rains all the time. No thanks. And that's when I settled on New York City. I found a couple of places that were hiring for writing positions I was absolutely interested in, and applied to all of them, of course. I was hoping that one, just one, would take me. At that moment, I wanted it more than anything in the world. I'd already found a room to rent in an apartment with three other girls for a reasonable, by NYC standards, price. Everything in me was telling me moving to New York City was going to be a good thing. But man, was I wrong. I don't know if bigger cities just have more creeps or if they're just all really bold, but yuck. I hated all the unnecessary attention I was constantly getting from men literally everywhere I went. Just walking on the street or up the stairs to my apartment, it was so uncomfortable and had started to really get to me. My roommates all told me it was normal and if I wanted to live in the city, I'd have to learn to get used to it. That just made me even more angry about all of it. That it was something so normal to be experienced there that it was something to just be brushed off, forgotten about the second it happened. I hated that, but there was nothing I could do about it. I was too scared to say anything back to these people and I guess eventually I did get used to it and learn to ignore it. I forgot to mention I got a job working for a pretty well-known magazine. I wasn't exactly writing any articles, but I was still excited to be there. I had gotten a paid internship. I didn't make much, but the experience and opportunity to learn I thought was worth it. Unfortunately, the catcalling and unwanted attention from men didn't stop when I entered the workplace. It was actually somewhat worse. The men in the top positions in the building felt emboldened by their status and obviously knew no one would do anything to them when they did something anyone else would consider wrong. And not just wrong in the business sense of the word wrong in the moral sense as well. I found myself in an awful position, and in a place where anyone I told just told me to keep my mouth shut about it all, and that the stuff I was saying wasn't something anyone talked about there. This one day, after I had been working with the company for about six months, I was called into one of the higher-ups offices. I knocked before entering and was told to come in. I noticed right away that he was an older man, probably in his sixties, he sat at a large desk in front of a huge window with the most beautiful view overlooking the city. He must have seen me staring out the window because he offered to let me stand by him to get a better look. I thought it was a nice gesture and happily agreed. I made my way next to him and stood, admiring the city I now called home. He was sitting directly next to me and had turned his chair to join me in looking out the window. That's when I felt it. His hand was traveling up my thigh and made its way to the rest of my butt. I don't even know the words to express my feelings at that very moment. It's like it was a mixture of a bunch of emotions. I was feeling angry at the fact that he felt that he could touch me, scared that I was alone in a room with this man, ashamed that it had been about 30 seconds and I still hadn't swatted his hand away, and scared at what he would do when I did. I couldn't let it go on any longer. I rushed away from him and asked him what he was doing. He actually pretended not to know what I was referring to, like I had made the whole thing up. After arguing with him about it for a couple of minutes, I decided going to HR was my best option. I quickly made my way to the elevator and pressed the floor I was going to. The second those doors closed, I burst out crying. 
I didn't even know how I was holding back tears, and when they started, they just wouldn't stop. The elevator dinged and signaled that it was my stop. I got out and made my way into the office where an older woman was sitting behind the desk. I told her there was something I wanted to report, and she very bluntly told me that if it had anything to do with the guy who had just touched me, that there was no point and that I should just get back to work. I was confused how she knew that's what I was there for, but eventually I understood. I wasn't the only woman he'd done this to, and wasn't the first to come to HR to try to report him. I felt defeated. I was always told that whenever something like this happens to tell someone about it, to get help if I needed it. And there I was, trying to do exactly that, and the person who was supposed to help me was adamant that there was nothing that could be done. The next day I was called into his office again. I was only an intern and whenever the other male interns were called into his office, he only needed coffee or for them to run some paperwork to somewhere else in the office. So when he asked for me, I asked one of the guys to go for me. I was scared of that man. I was scared of what he might do to me if I stepped foot in his office again and I definitely wasn't going to risk it. Later that day I got an email from him. It said something like, the next time I ask for you, it better be you who comes. Don't forget, I can end your career in the city before you can even blink. It was intimidating. Of course it was intimidating. There I was, a 21-year-old girl faced with a man telling me he was going to ruin my career if I didn't do what he asked. The next day, he obviously asked for me again. I entered his office and stayed right by his door, so I couldn't give him a way to get close to me and I had a quick exit if needed. He began telling me about articles the magazine had published the day before. He sounded funny though. The way he talked wasn't his usual manner of speaking. He began to stutter and his body was shaking. I only realized what he had been doing when he let out a loud moan and his head rolled back. Yep, yeah, he was doing exactly what you think he was doing. I don't even want to say it. I yelled at him that he was disgusting and ran out of his office as fast as I could. I honestly didn't care about that internship at that point. I didn't care about anything that man had to say about me around the city. I could find another job somewhere else. If I had to move, I didn't care. But I couldn't let him get away with what he was doing. I went to the police, and they told me that without proof, there really was nothing they could do. I filed a report anyways. I went back to the apartment and told my roommates what happened. Of course, they were as creeped out and disgusted as me, but shockingly told me to keep the internship. They said the job was so good that having to put up with one pervy man was worth it. I tried complaining to HR again, this time insisting I at least be moved to a different floor. I was willing to try to find a new job, but I kind of needed this one to pay rent while I looked for a different one. I was moved a few floors down and for the next couple of weeks after that I had no issues. And that's when the emails started coming in. They were always from a new anonymous email address and every single one contained a nude photo, always from the same person. Unfortunately, I could tell. I informed the police who again told me there wasn't much they could do. I started hating everything about the city. I hated how everyone told me this was normal and that I should put up with it. I just wanted someone to listen to me and agree that what I was going through, what I was being put through actually, was not okay. I knew exactly who was sending me those photos and I just couldn't take it anymore. I sent an email to everyone in the office detailing what had happened to me. I explained everything I went through and how many times I tried to report it to HR and how they did nothing to help me. Then I quit. For the next few days I got emails from some of the other women in the office telling me that they had experienced the same or similar things with the man who had touched me. I was so mad that no one would do anything about it but at least everyone knew now. I never went back so I never saw the fallout from my email myself. I hope he got what he deserved, although I know he probably didn't. I found a better job at a different company that I absolutely adore working at. I'm treated great and can gladly say I've not experienced anything like this since. To any woman out there who is going through or has gone through something similar and they feel like there is no one out there who understands or who listens, just know that you're not alone. We are here, ready, 
and willing to hear you. I guess the only reason I'm even telling this story is to somehow try to move past the things that happened that day and the trauma and scars that had left me. My therapist says to move on, I have to talk about it, and I don't want to talk to anyone I actually know, so here I am, telling strangers on the internet about the worst day of my life. I live in what some people would call a third world country. I'm from the United States originally, but moved to this place when I was relocated for work. I honestly figured it wouldn't be that bad considering I was a man and men usually are treated better in that country. I don't want to name exactly where this was because I really don't want things to turn political or for people to make assumptions about what happened just based on the place. Part of me is also worried that if I tell you where this happened, you'd be able to find an article about it online and possibly find out who I am. But maybe that's the paranoia my therapist was telling me about manifesting itself. Anyways, a little bit about me. I'm currently 32 years old, but when this happened I was in my late 20s. At the time I was somewhat overweight and didn't get out much so when my job needed someone to relocate to another country, I volunteered, figuring it would be the push that I needed to try new things and go new places. I had to take five flights to get there and by the time the last flight landed, I was completely exhausted and not at all excited about starting work in a whole new place. I had a few days to settle into my new apartment before my first day at the office about 30 minutes away. What I do isn't super interesting, lots of paperwork and phone calls, part of me didn't even understand why they actually needed me there since everything I was doing was something I could have done back home, but I was already there and I had a contract for one year so I had to stick it out whether I liked it or not. I got to my apartment and was immediately disappointed. It looked literally nothing like the pictures that had been posted online. Actually, it was a whole different layout. When I tried to complain to the building manager, he just stared at me until I realized that he had no idea what I was saying. I made my way back up to my cockroach-infested apartment and had no hope for the next year. I immediately regretted my decision to go there, but unfortunately, there was no going back. My first day went okay. No one really cared that I was there and for the most part, Everyone just left me alone. My boss barely spoke any English, so we said as much as we could to each other in terms of introductions before I went and sat at my dusty old desk that I'd be sitting at for the next whole year of my life. The first week went okay. I noticed a few of my coworkers staring at me and whispering things to each other while they did. I honestly didn't care at all, though, considering I had no idea what they were saying anyways. I liked keeping to myself. It made the time pass by faster and when I zoned everything else out, I actually bought myself a pair of noise cancelling headphones to make it even quieter. The next month we got a notice not to come into work for a few days since they were remodeling and I happily stayed home and thank god for the time off. It was much needed. By the time I went back into work, they had added all new cubicles. It was so much nicer and honestly made me want to stay at work even longer to escape the bugs in my apartment building. I found myself working 12 hour days, which at first I thought would have been an issue for the company considering four of those hours were overtime, but it wasn't. I was actually getting so much work done I got an email from corporate congratulating me on how fast I was helping the branch catch up with their late work. By month three I had this whole routine down. I woke up at 6am every morning and made myself breakfast and checked the news. Then at 7.30 I began my walk to work and by 8 I was there about 30 minutes early every day. Actually, usually I was the first person to get there. Then I would put on my noise cancelling headphones and get to work, and some days I never even took them off. This was one of those days. I got to work at 8am as usual and everything seemed very normal. I sat at my desk and plopped on my trusty noise cancelling headphones and got to work. I love the cubicles because it secluded me so much than when we just had regular desks. Even in the little doorway in the cubicle, I added a curtain to block myself off even more. It was like my own little room where no one ever disturbed me. It was great. I got to work and for the next few hours everything went smoothly. I kept my head down and my work as usual and like every other day I had no issues. At around 1pm I felt the vibration underneath my feet of a lot of footsteps walking quickly out of the office. It even felt like some people might be running. 
but it was lunchtime and I naively chalked it up to people eagerly heading to lunch. I never even lifted my head to see what was going on. By 1.15, the power went off. The whole floor went dark with only bits of sunlight peering in between the blinds on the windows, illuminating the ceiling. I slowly removed my headphones and stood up. And that's when I realized that I was the only person in the office. I walked to our manager's doorway, but he was also nowhere to be found. 1.20 p.m. And that's when I saw the smoke. It went from completely clear air in the room to smoke so thick I could barely see five feet in front of me in the span of only ten minutes. It was seeping up from the ground underneath me. I started to cough so hard it felt like my lungs were going to burst out of my chest. I started to make my way to the stairwell, but with every step it felt like my body was getting heavier and heavier. At that point I ripped off my shirt and balled it up, shoving it against my mouth and nose to try to filter the air. I knew my lungs had already been coated with ash and soot, but I had to do something. The ground underneath me was hot, burning hot. It felt like my shoes were melting and the bottoms of my feet were being branded with white hot metal. It was excruciating. I still had about 50 feet between me and the stairwell door, but to me, in that situation, it felt more like 500 feet. At that point, the walls around me started to catch fire. The flames were so hot that even when I was standing a whole 20 feet away from it, it felt like the heat was melting away at my skin. I was terrified. It was like I was a kid again and all I wanted was my dad to come in and save me from this horrible situation and pain I was experiencing. I started to pray. I was praying every second I was in that building. Every second I felt my skin burning off. Please God, please let me survive this. Please give me the strength to escape this building. Please, I'm not ready to die. Every step I took felt like walking on lava. I was determined to live through this. The building around me had started to fall apart as I was surrounded by flames. 1.35 p.m. I actually made it to the stairwell door. I placed my hand on the door handle and the searing pain of the metal touching my skin had me pulling my hand back toward my body so fast I actually hit myself in the chest. I had to think quickly. I lowered my shirt from my mouth and wrapped it around my head. I knew the handle would still be hot, but any barrier was better than none. I braced myself for the pain I was about to experience and again, set my hand on the handle and pulled quickly. It hurt, but at this point I think my body began going into shock. My legs began to burn and when I looked down I saw my pants had burned away from my body and my legs were now exposed to the flames and heat that had started to engulf me. I knew I had to make a decision. I had to go as fast as I could down those stairs, no matter how painful it would be or I would die. I put my shirt back to my face, took as deep a breath as I could, and began jumping down the stairs. I skipped as many as I could in hopes that it would get me down faster. I screamed in pain with each step, but eventually found myself on the bottom floor in front of the door that would lead to salvation. The stairwell had begun to fall apart above me, pieces of metal and wood raining down as I pushed against the door. Once outside, I was greeted by firemen yelling in my face in a language I didn't understand. The shock must have worn off because everything went black. The next thing I remember, I was in the hospital. The doctor told me over 70% of my body had been seriously burned and damaged by the fire, but that I would survive. The pain, even in the hospital, was excruciating. I called my mom and dad who were already arranging for me to be transported home for better medical care. I was in the hospital in that foreign country for two months before I was stable enough to be moved. The worst part was the debridement, which is where they remove dead tissue from your wounds. They literally are taking off pieces of your skin to ensure you don't get an infection. I knew it was part of the treatment process, but it felt like literal torture. For the longest time, I blamed my co-workers. I felt like they left me there to die. In reality, my boss, in very broken English, told me they didn't even know I was there. I made no sound throughout the whole day and because I always arrived at work 30 minutes early, no one had seen me come in. My resentment toward them eventually went away and I now realize it wasn't their fault. As it turned out, a car had caught on fire parked in the alleyway next to the building. Because the building was old, it was made of cheap materials that caught on fire easily and there was no stopping it apparently. They thought everyone had gotten out 
and I guess no one had thought to get a head count. When I ended up coming out of the building, everyone was shocked that I had been in there all that time. Recovery has been one of the hardest things I've ever gone through, but I am so grateful I escaped with my life. One thing I learned from all of this is, I guess it doesn't really pay to be a loner. So everything I'm about to tell you is going to sound pretty insane and I urge you to hear me out. Everything will start to make sense towards the end. I just have to tell it in a way where you can understand my fear in the same way I felt it. It's definitely the craziest event in my life that most people assume is fake, but I encourage you to have an open mind and try to understand not everything that seems fake actually is. I'll try to keep everything as detailed as possible so that you can accurately understand what I was going through and the insane things I was seeing that night. Okay, so at the time I was around 35 years old and working as a janitor in a fairly large office building. Large enough where I had many other co-workers helping me clean up around the place during the day, but small enough where only one person worked throughout the night. Only at night we also worked as security as well as performing our janitorial duties. I have to say, I actually really like my job, and I love taking the night shift. I was more of the keep-to-myself type, so working alone didn't bother me. I also wasn't the kind of person to be scared of unoccupied buildings or dark places. I never had an issue in the office before, and whenever the opportunity to work nights came up, I always was the first to volunteer. This night was a little different, though. I wouldn't usually admit this, but it's pretty relevant to the story, so I kind of have to. So whenever I worked nights, like I mentioned before, I was the only person in the building... I have keys to every office and access to every file cabinet, desk, and so on. Well, I use that to my advantage. I'm a very nosy person and I have no issue going through everyone's belongings and occasionally taking the things I liked and never saying anything when it came up to these specific things being missing. No one suspected me and I never really stopped doing it. If anything, it actually got worse. I started taking more and more stuff and maybe I'll even admit that it had begun to become a problem. I wiped the cameras every morning before I left so in case anyone ever thought to check them, they'd find nothing. It was like a routine at this point. I did notice people starting to lock their desks and cabinets more often, but I still took from the ones who didn't. Now, I didn't consider myself a thief. I wasn't taking things like expensive jewelry or anything of actual value. I took things like pens, ones I thought looked cool or like unopened snacks, stuff like that. Stuff I knew people wouldn't truly miss. I guess I should have realized it was wrong because doing this is actually what led to the scariest night of my life. It was a Friday night and everyone had left for the weekend. I had volunteered for the night shift once again. I showed up at around 8pm at which point the daytime janitors handed over the keys to me. It was starting to get cloudy outside and that night we were expecting a pretty bad thunder and lightning storm. I actually loved storms though, so I wasn't worried. The next few hours I spent cleaning up around the offices and in the bathrooms. My least favorite part of the job was definitely emptying the trash cans in the bathroom, just such disgusting stuff people put in there. Anyways, then came my favorite part, snooping in people's desks. It became almost like a game to me, or a mystery. What will I find today? Sometimes, to make it more interesting, I would try to guess what was in each person's desk before I opened it. If I got it right or close enough, I would take what was in there. If I got it wrong, I wouldn't. Ah, who am I kidding? I mostly just took the stuff no matter what, but I found a lot of snacks, which I always appreciated. The vending machines didn't run at night for some reason, and I was usually pretty hungry by the middle of my shift. The manager's offices usually had mini fridges that were stocked with some pretty tasty stuff, so I usually went for that first. This night, when I opened the mini fridge in one of the larger offices... I found some gummy bears. I really didn't understand why they were in the fridge to begin with, but I wasn't going to let that stop me from taking and eating them. They tasted a little funny, but still sweet, so I ate them all. It kind of started to hurt my stomach, so I turned off the lights in the office and sat down in the chair in the corner of the room. It was almost pitch black in the building with little bits of moonlight coming in through the large windows lining the walls. The storm had apparently not started yet. After about 30 minutes, my vision started to get a little fuzzy, and then I started seeing things. 
things that weren't supposed to be there. I lifted my hands in front of my face, but they didn't look like my hands. They started to transform or meld into what looked like claws. Then the claws started to crack and break, and from between the cracks emerged almost like little spiders. And at this point I started to freak out. My spatial awareness seemed off, too. I knew I was in a large room, but it felt so small. I stood up and looked toward the corner of the room, and it looked like a man was standing there in the dark. I could see the shape of his body, and his eyes looked like they were glowing. I tried to scream at him to leave, but nothing came out. I looked at my reflection in the window and my mouth. It was gone. You know that scene in The Matrix when Neo is talking to Agent Smith and then his mouth disappears? Yeah, exactly like that. I knew I needed to get out of there. I looked back toward the man in the corner, only now he was incredibly tall and looming over me. His hands were like shadows reaching toward me, trying to engulf me in the darkness. His eyes glowed red as he let out this monstrous laugh of ha, ha, ha. I felt the tears begin to fill my eyes and my heart began to race. I had no idea what was going on. I felt like I had just entered hell and skipped the death part. I started to run, only I thought I was running. Except every time my feet met the ground, it was as if I was moving in slow motion. The chairs in front of everyone's desk started to turn into what I can only describe as demonic creatures. It was like they were all emerging from the darkness with the intent to harm me. They didn't speak, only laughed. My tears began to feel like acid running down my face. Instinctively, I began swatting and clawing at my face, trying to make the pain go away. I wanted whatever was going on to just be over. I eventually made my way to the bathroom, but when I walked in, the lights were red and the walls were covered in what seemed like blood. The sound of heavy footsteps behind me sent chills down my spine, and I had to hide. I had to escape whatever was following me. I stepped into the blood, and it felt it squish under my feet. The squeaking from my tennis shoes meeting the blood-soaked floor filled the room. I opened the bathroom stall door and locked it behind me. I hopped onto the toilet, picking my feet off the floor to make it harder for that creature to find me. I heard the bathroom door open. It was like I could feel it in the room with me. My heart was beating so fast it felt like I was going to have a heart attack at any second. All the stall walls and doors began to rattle as it started to laugh. Even louder than before... I shut my eyes, but somehow still could see what was happening around me. It was almost like I had no eyelids. Suddenly, I heard laughter directly above me. I looked up and was met with the most horrifying thing I'd ever seen. The shadow creature now had long horns. His face was completely black with no dimension whatsoever. When it opened its mouth, I saw its sharp teeth that seemed to go on forever. Its eyes were yellow now as it stared down at me reaching toward me while it continued to laugh. I didn't know what else to do. I opened the stall door and stumbled my way out of the bathroom as fast as I could. I found an office that looked fairly normal and dialed 911. I told the operator what was happening to me and she didn't believe me at first. She said prank calling the police was illegal. I told her I was telling the truth and to send officers to the building. Finally, she agreed, probably because she legally had to send them. And they were there in about 10 minutes, I guess and those ten minutes were some of the worst of my life and felt like forever. The creatures seemed to multiply and surround me as I clutched my head in my hands and covered my eyes to possibly shield myself from whatever they might do and not hear that awful laughter. The police arrived only to find me in the fetal position, not able to move or talk with lacerations all over my face. An ambulance was called and they took me straight to the hospital. I had to be sedated since I was experiencing such severe hallucinations that made it impossible for them to treat me. I woke up in a hospital bed in a psychiatric ward the next day, and I was informed that my blood tests revealed that I had massive amounts of LSD in my system. The police came and asked me where I'd gotten the drugs, and of course I had no idea. I must have been poisoned. And that's when it hit me. The gummy bears. It had to be the gummy bears. I told them everything, even the fact that I'd been stealing from my co-workers. I mean, I had to make it clear that I wasn't some junkie or drug dealer or something. Unfortunately, I've eaten all the so-called evidence, so they had nothing to test. But I guess they figured they'd give me the benefit of the doubt. 
I looked in the mirror on the way out of the hospital and I truly did look insane. I had scratch marks all the way down my face from where I thought my tears were acid. I had black eyes from where I kept shoving my face in my hands and missing hair that I guess I had pulled out during the whole ordeal. I was also fired that day since the police informed my employer about what I'd been doing. I didn't really care about losing my job. I don't think I could ever enter that office again. There's no way that I could see it the same way I once did. I still get a bad feeling even when I just drive by the building. No one fessed up to having the drugs, of course, and from that day on I vowed to never, ever steal anything from anyone ever again. I still have nightmares of that night and the shadow man. I sometimes even still see his eyes in the darkness and hear his laugh when it's just a little too quiet. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, my voice is like a cross between Fergie and Jesus. Jesus.